The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. Our uh, friends at Grace City Stapleton, I was there last week uh, preaching at their church and they wanted to send their love and their greetings uh, to Southside Bible Church. They're going to be moving into an inner city uh, building and so if we be keeping them in prayers and just ways that we'll be able to encourage and help them in that journey. So we'll keep lifting them up. Uh, thanks to Pastor Rutland. Whenever he says he's got a sermon burning on his heart, I'd love to get out of the way. And I understand you guys were greatly blessed. So Brian, get start praying for that next one, brother, and let's go. Uh, Shelby and John got married yesterday. It was beautiful ceremony and just uh, just enjoying watching both families, how they glorified God, and it was just a really uh, special time seeing them unite themselves before God in holy matrimony. Well, this morning, we're going to finish up our study. If you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 11, uh, and if you'll remember, when we started this section, I, I said we'll do a flyover, and we looked at that uh, spiritual growth, that God has done everything necessary for you to grow spiritually. We should expect and anticipate to be growing in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we kind of took a look at the forest, and then we spent several weeks looking at the trees in this section of digging into the details, and they were just so rich. And I told you what we would do afterwards is another flyover once we were done, because I believe we've landed in a section of Scripture that uh, Southside Bible Church needs. And that is my prayer and goal this morning. If you're visiting, there's this Greek word that we stumbled and came on to in Second Peter called epigenosis. And gnosis means knowledge, and epi means full. And it's this knowledge that God gives to us in Christ where we know Him. And then this word uh, we, we know, and it, it brings us into this relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we've been looking at that, and that's what we're seeking. That's what we're aiming at as we study the Word of God. And so this morning, as we do this flyover, I want to make sure, I want to take your knowledge that you've learned of this section, and, and you've learned what Peter's teaching us. You understand it now, and now, God, will you make it practical? I want it to, to change your life. I don't want you just to mark up a notebook and walk away and say, what's next? I need to inform our minds, stir our affections, and activate our will. I want your wills walking in a different and deeper direction. I want the fruits of verses 5 through 7 of, Peter said, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And he says, these must be increasing in your lives. That's what this truth should be producing in every believer's life. So this, this morning, is our application. And I'm going to seek to make it as practical as I know how. I want to shepherd you into the good shepherd, lead you into the paths of righteousness so that you will not want because you have everything in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want you to do an honest examination before God as to whether this is just cold knowledge to you, or if this are the words of life. Is it epigenosis, or have you been in religion your whole life, been a part of churches, and you have never come all the way to Jesus Christ? That is what I pray for every soul this morning, that no one walks out of here without the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been asking him for that for every heart that sits here this morning. Paul in Ephesians is Robin, or who, who read this morning? Nate. Nate Thompson. Uh, he, he wrote about the, uh, Christ and all of his beauties in Ephesians as we read seven verses of that this morning. And then when he finished, he prayed and he said to the church at Ephesus, I pray that you get epigenosis. I pray now that, you, that this knowledge will get into your hearts. I, I'm, I'm, Paul is just begging before God, let them have epigenosis. And so I want to follow that pattern this morning. And I want to go to the throne of grace and I want God to ask God to do that in our hearts this morning. So let's go to the throne of grace that is paved by the blood of Jesus Christ that we have full access with confidence this morning. Father, we draw near. And God, I'm asking that as we unfold these words and look at them, this beautiful season we've had in the Word together, Lord, let not one soul not have epigenosis. God, let every one of us be refreshed again in the glories and the beauties of Jesus Christ. 
Don't let cold knowledge be replaced with warm-hearted devotion to Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, would you do that through your truth this morning in every heart? God, do what no man can do, but only your Spirit. I pray that you would meet us in this flyover this morning of your beautiful Word that has been inspired by your Holy Spirit so that what we look at is perfect. It's the message from Almighty God to us this morning, God. Let that land beautifully and heavily upon the hearts this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 Peter 1.1-11 1, 1 through 11, As we finished up this section, what has really jumped off the pages to me is if you'll go back to verse 1, where he says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. To those who have received the gift of faith, the, the very gift to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it was given to you by God. And Peter's saying it's the same of, as, as the faith that he's given to me, the Apostle Paul. It's the same faith that he has given to you. It's a faith that works. It's a faith that really does join you to Jesus Christ. And so I thank God for the faith that we've received. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. They can't see his glory or his beauty. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shown into our hearts to give the light of the epigenosis of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He said, let there be light. And he gave you epigenosis to see the beauties of Jesus Christ to where I could never walk away now because he's so beautiful and lovely. He gave you epigenosis. He gave you the ability to see that Christ is altogether lovely. He's not a cold, sterile doctrine. He is a living Savior who is worthy to take up your cross and die and follow Him the rest of your days. I heard about Jesus my whole life, since I was a lad. But my popularity and my own pleasure were all that mattered, except during Holy Week and Lent, I would get real serious. And then God started drawing me to Himself in college, and I was sitting at Mile High Stadium at a Billy Graham crusade, and finally it just broke in, and there was this epigenosis of the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ and what He has done. And I could see finally what Jesus had done for me. And, and as Wesley said, my heart was strangely warm that even my sins were forgiven at that cross, and He became the supreme object of my heart, and He is as I stand here this morning. And so what a gift. What a gift. And the Bible then became my lifeline. Almost immediately, I bought this big, huge, red Strong's Concordance. <laughs> and I just, I loved that book. I, I hate computers because I don't have big books like that anymore. And I just remember every morning getting and looking up the Greek words and wherever I was studying and praying, and I just could not get enough and, and been doing that since 1987, and I stand here this morning seeing in a mirror dimly the fullness of Christ and what He purchased for me, and I long for that day when I'll no longer see it in a mirror dimly. But I'll tell you what, what I see this morning, what I've seen in this Word, He's, be he's beautiful, and He's lovely, and I, lo I love the view of this gift of faith, of epigenosis. I'm teaching through Romans on Tuesday nights, and Romans 3.11 hit me so hard that there's none who understands, not even one. And I, you could read this Bible cover to cover for the rest of your lives, and you'll never get it. He says you'll never understand it unless God gives you the gift of faith to see it. And so I hope you treasure what you have here this morning, is that God let you get it. He opened your minds, and He, he showed you the glory and the beauty of Christ. And so the best that I could have ever had was just a bunch of knowledge. And no matter how much I would have read and studied, I could have never understood it. 
And as I shepherd you guys, the, the beauty is you've given up everything. So many of you have given up your resources, your time, your talents, your plans, your hope, your ambitions, because you have epigenosis. You don't make sense. You don't belong in this world. You're passing through, but you've seen something of Christ that all of my counseling is, how can I live more holy? How can I live more consecrated to Christ? Why? Because you've seen it. You've seen him and you want to give him everything. You just want to serve him. I love it. We battle sin. We battle our flesh. Yes, but you've, you've been given the gift of faith. Join together, lock shields and journey till we put down our cross and we see him. And so I pray that you marvel and you just never get over that God has given you the gift of faith so that no one can boast. To walk in a world where they can't see it. They don't know over what they're stumbling. They flee when no one is chasing. They have fears and they're hiding and running. And I can see I have faith and I know why all this exists. and I know where it's all moving. I know what it is for him to be the supreme object of my life and my hope. And so thank you, Father. Amen. The gift of faith, I just don't think we treasure it the way we should. It's just been blowing off the pages at me as I keep looking at this and praying over it. You have received a faith of the same kind as ours. What's my greatest need? What's your greatest need this morning? Peter answers that in verse 2. He says, your greatest need is him and Paul and all the New Testament writers begin every letter grace and peace. But the greatest need then that all of us have is I need the grace of God and the peace that comes from knowing this God and being safe with this God who's a father. So what, what, what I need to grow in, he said, is grace and peace. That is what the Christian needs. So how do I get that? How do I get it multiplied to me? How do I get it abundantly supplied? And Peter says it's supplied to you in a person. Jesus Christ Here's the supply. Here's everything that you need for grace and peace. So you don't learn it in a manual. You don't get it in some book. You get it from a person. Here he is, Jesus Christ. And you have epigenosis. You have faith to see him now, to look upon him. You have the epigenosis of Christ. And that's how you're going to grow in grace and peace. You've got to learn him. You've got to learn him in this word. Cover to cover, he says, it points to me. And you got to learn him experientially and him shepherding you in your day-to-day -day life and your communion with him. And so please, nobody walk away from this section and miss this. This is what we need. The knowledge of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. I have everything to live a life of godliness but it's through the true knowledge, the epigenosis of Him who called us by His own glory and His excellence. I have everything I need to live this Christian life through Jesus Christ. And we took a week to just look at what is epigenosis. And we looked at Christ as your shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And because you have Him, you won't want. He's a husband. And he, he, He's given Himself to purify you and present you spotless and blameless on the last day. There's, there's an intimacy with Him. He's a priest. He bled and died so that we now could have God. He's a prophet. My sheep hear my voice. He teaches us from this Word. He's a king to rule and to reign over your life. And, I, and uh, Newton said his favorite is he's, he's my best friend. He's the best friend that I have, this Christ. So truth can't just stay in your noggin, okay? It's got to be understood and seen by faith. If it's not united with faith, in Hebrews 3 and 4, it says it'll do you no good. It's got to be united with faith. And it has to work its way out into how we live. It's got to do that. It has to work its way out. Our seeing Him as our all in all, it's got to get worked out. And so pray for this every time you read your Bible and after you read it. God, give me epigenosis. Every book I read, lead me into more intimacy with Christ. Come to church. Use this this morning to draw me closer to Christ. When I go to a Bible study, give me Christ. 
when you meet with someone, encourage me in Christ. Go after this as if it's precious gold. I want to know him. I got to know Christ. Paul said that I may know him. And then verse 4, for by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Every one of them. He said every promise in, in the Bible is yea and amen in Christ. Do you realize the promises that you have this morning of reconciliation to God? They're ours and they're certain. And I just want the church of God to live like they're certain. These are everything to us. This is why we gather. This is what our hope is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And we look at these precious and these magnificent promises in the Word of God, and you know what faith says? Mine. They're mine in Christ. And faith says, I live in light of these promises. I live looking for their certain fulfillment. I want you to get this. Faith says, my best day is my death day. It's my chariot ride to glory, to die is gain. I just want people who believe that this death has been conquered, what we just sang about. And when I die, I'm going to go into that presence and I'm going to look to that and I'm going to fix my hope on that. They're, these promises are so big. I've got to stay in the Word of God and I have to read them by faith. The promises of God, hear this, do you no good if you don't believe them? Okay, you can sing about them till the cows come home, but if you don't believe them, they're, gonna, they're not going to do you any good at all. You have the gift of faith. And you say, these are mine. And what is at the heart of all these promises in verse 4? He said, this hint clause, the purpose is that you might be a partaker of the divine nature. And that was that word for koinonia, to share, to have in common, to have fellowship. You, you have koinonia with God. Don't let that bounce off. Every promise is leading to that. Justification, sanctification, that He'll meet you. Every promise that you have, it leads you to God. To have koinonia. That's where every promise goes. They all lead us to this. And this is what heaven is, to be forever with the Lord. I'm His and He is mine. And so I love these large, magnificent promises because what they tell me is I'm, I, get, I get God forever. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it breaks my heart. How many people stop short of Christ? I've been a pastor, and I, I, when you can't even remember how many years it's been. It's been a long time, but I, I think it's 32. 32 years. And it, it breaks my heart how many people stop at just going to church and they don't come all the way to Christ. They stop at creeds. They stop at just moral, being moral. They stop at going to prayer meetings, potlucks, which are beautiful, outreaches, music. But they never come to Jesus Christ. They just stay on the outside. And this whole gospel is, I want, to, I want you to come all the way to me and have me and let all the blessings flow from communion and union with Jesus Christ. Don't stop short of Christ. The great joy of the thief on the cross, today you will be with who? Me in paradise. Come. Come to me. What is it? This is what the gospel gives to us. This is what faith secures. It gives you Christ. Every Wednesday morning at our elder meetings, we take turns doing um, devotionals. And this Wednesday morning just took a beautiful turn when one of our elders had, is teaching on that Jesus is the good shepherd from John 15. And, and he says, my sheep hear my voice and they, they hear it. And he says, the reason I'm growing in assurance is because I just spent an hour before this meeting hearing his voice. And tears are flowing down this man's face because he's communing with Jesus Christ, saying it's better than heaven. It's better. It's, this is everything. This is it. Please don't come short of that. Don't stop at external things and miss the beauties and the sweetness of this gospel. And, and some of you are still outside of Christ and you're happy with religion and morality. Don't die there gospel is to bring you to God. 
But now this is the practical part. That was all for free. That was review. Okay? This is what I wanted to shoot at, is how, do I, how does this get practical? And that's what I, I want you to not miss. And go back to verse 4. <clears throat> By these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises for the purpose that by them you might become, may become partakers of the divine nature. And then this participle phrase I love, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And so here it is. Here's a picture of this world, this cosmos. Everyone in it, you're born in Adam, and you come into this world in bondage. You're spiritually dead, and you're a slave to your own lusts. You're just these little lust machines trying to find something to put it on, and you'll put it on anything but God. So you're, you're a slave to your own lusts. And, and he says it's bringing corruption. The reason this world is decaying and falling apart and none of our slogans are working, just say no to drugs, don't do this or that, it's falling apart and decaying because it's in bondage to its own lusts. Why? Because everyone on the planet is separated from God. And this deep desire that God made in every one of you was to know Him and to commune with Him. And now that deep desire is placed on you. It's you. My whole desire is for everything can serve me and meet my needs. And so you look at this world that was to be enjoyed as you walked with God in fellowship. It was a gift from God to be blessed. And now you're trying to fill that void with what has been left in your heart with the absence of God. And you keep running after idol after thing to say, I've got to fill this void. What will do it? This person will do it. This job will do it. You just keep running with these lusts saying, fill it, fill it. Fill my empty heart at any cost. Just fill it. There's no way out of it. And you even knew it wasn't working. This isn't working. I can't get out of this. You would just shift your, this is called a, an epithumia. Thumia means desire and epi means over. And so it can be for a good thing, a bad thing, but it's this over desire that's controlling you. And maybe it was materialism. And all you could think of is how you could get more money to be secure. And you've replaced it now with, oh, I'm going to serve the poor and just be a good person and make the world a better place. You're in this exact same predicament. You went from anxiety to now trying to control everything. And we just keep shuffling the furniture around on the Titanic with our epithumias, and we can't get out of it. Nothing could set you free. Twelve steps, all your things could not fix this. Nothing could give you true peace. You were in bondage to these lusts with no object but self. What a horrible place to be. That's death. That's separation from God. And I want to flesh this out this morning. Sorry. So no one in this body misses it. And I'm praying that God would expose and deliver us from our epithumias this morning for, for your good and God's glory. And I'm going to keep quoting John Newton because that's who's lighting me up right now, okay? <coughs> here's, here's how Newton began this section I want to look at. And if you're, if you're visiting, John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. He was a slave trader, got converted, beautiful, beautiful man of God, was an excellent pastor and hymn writer. And he said, if we are convinced that communion with Christ is our chief good, why is living in the light of his presence so difficult? If this is what's going to bless me the most, why is it so difficult to just stay there? Why are we so christ negligent. Why is it that our minds are so scattered when it comes to Christ? Newton admitted this. He said, I approach the throne of grace encumbered with a thousand distractions of thought, each of which seems to engage more of my attention than the business I have in hand. This is the battle of the Christian life and where Newton turns particularly and practical. The Christian life is bound up with clear thinking and the enemies are the clouds and the trifles of life that take our eyes off of Christ. So our enemies are anything that takes our eyes and focus off of Jesus Christ. And now Newton's going to share some of these distractions called epithumias 
that can eclipse Christ in our heart. And so what I wanted to do this morning as we come out of this section is for you to look at these and ask if the the beauties of Christ have eclipsed these or am I still looking at self? So we're going to look at a couple of them. Let's start with the distraction of entertainment. Our attention to Christ is far too easily distracted with these marauding affections, Newton said, that jump from thrill to thrill with entertainment. Uh, it's, America spends more money on entertainment than over 27 other countries' gross national products. We're just entertainment freaks. And you just keep running from one thing to the next, and you're using entertainments and, and amusements as escapism to not deal with life and the realities of the fall and what's going on in your heart, uh, to find our joy in them and not in Christ. He said, religion which does not engage the whole heart for the Lord can be little better than a name. (laughs) The comforts of the gospel neither require nor admit such poor assistance as worldly amusements offer. They can't fix it. These amusements cannot nourish a living soul. Only Christ can. And this, this pursuit of amusements will never fix the real problem. Christ's sufficiency and fullness provides a feast of eternal joy and significance. So don't seek entertainment as an epithemia because Christ is not enough. Don't keep trying to fill your heart with all these things. Uh, It's a cheap substitute and it fills our land and unfortunately it fills our churches. Please don't let any cheap substitute get in the way of this sweet Christ. Fill yourself constantly with what Christ has done for our eternal souls. And this is why trials, Newton said, are so good, because the onrush of stinging realism, chasing the idolized party we call life, these trials come and they wake us up so that we might run to the all-sufficient one. God will be good to bring trials so that you'll, you'll wake up and realize, man, this is what I really need. Christ is all. Secondly, We're distracted by worldliness. We cannot serve God and money. I read an article a couple weeks ago, and I can't remember when it was written, but they said, I think it was like 40 years ago, that they predicted uh, in the American workforce it would become a two-day work week. You'd work two days and be off five days because of where technology was going, and you would just, it, it would fill it up, which some of you are like, that would be really nice. But instead... In the article, it says the statistics show we're working harder now than we've ever worked because we, he said, we quit working to just provide, but now our, our jobs have become our identity. It's, it's like this is my identity and who I am, and we're, we're working even harder for this identity. And, and you can't cling to Christ as your highest good and financial security as your highest good. The, the two can't marry together. We can't keep our eyes on Jesus while our greed for lust and for worldly security overwhelm our hearts. Worldliness will corrode your soul's joy in Christ. The world is a tyranny of of different and opposite passions. Uh, One man said that affections for Christ and desires for worldly comfort, they're mutually expulsive. A love for the world drives out affection for Christ. And admiration for Christ pushes out the affections of our worldly idols. They play against each other. Friendship with the world, said James, is enmity toward God. And love for Christ is enmity toward our idols. And so Newton says again, the holiness of a sinner seems principally to consist in self-abasement and in admiring views of Jesus as a complete Savior. These are the main principles from whence every gracious fruit is derived. In proportion as we have these, we'll be humble, meek, patient, weaned from the world, and devoted to God. So aim at the world, and it will cloud your views of Christ and His glory. It'll block, it'll be a cloud that just blocks it. And so get this, false securities and worldly pleasures are flashes of vanity distracting us from the sunshine of Christ and his beauties. A perfectly ordered home, job as an identity, a relationship, money, health at any cost, the list will go on and on. Those things will distract you from the glories and the beauties of Christ. Third thing, we've been distracted by legalism. 
Religion itself can get in the way of Christ. It's slain its thousands. When a sense of guilt and a lack of confidence in Christ, they push the Christian away from Christ. And it's a, it's a weird thought, but what it does is it, it promotes a wrong activity. An increasing confidence and self-righteousness. I got to clean up. I got to go fix myself up. I got to start going to church. And so you start running to self-righteousness and these insecurities will destroy communion with Christ. I've never seen anything destroy it quicker than legalism. Newton said, legalism is a wicked lie that puts a mirror in front of our faces and makes us think we're looking at Christ when we're actually adoring the ghost of our own self-righteousness. We're looking to our own selves to fix the problem, and we think it's Christ that's doing it. Eventually, we'll see our own righteousness as a filthy rag, and Satan will rush in, and he'll hold down the soul, he said, to the number, weight, and aggravation of its sins so that it shall not be able to look up to Jesus, nor draw draw any comfort from His blood and His promises and His grace. How many go burdened in this manner, seeking self-relief by doing duties, and perhaps spending their strength in things that aren't even commanded, though they hear and perhaps acknowledge the gospel while they're doing it. And so this legalism will lead you right away from Christ. And you'll start looking to your own merit, your own righteousness to try to feel good about yourself and feel that God loves you. And this will lead you away from Christ and worship and love to him faster than anything I've seen since I've been a minister. When we feel the weight of remaining sin and looking to Jesus, guys, is the only remedy. Not looking in a mirror of self-righteousness. The epithemia of self-righteousness to heal ourselves is a sin That will kill us. And so we're a people who look to Christ. Fourthly, distracted by self-consumed pride. We're distracted from this sweet Christ by our self-focus. If we could see Christ fully with our eyes of faith, we would be done with boasting about self. Could you imagine looking at the beauties of Christ? You're just kind of done with you. And it isn't, my life isn't about me and getting everyone to approve me and love me and like me. This is in the way. It just starves and it kills the beauties of Christ. He must increase and I must decrease. Get out of yourself. This is the the age of self like I have never seen. And look to Christ. Be done with this epithemia of self-exaltation. I'm nothing, he wrote. He is all. This is foolishness to the world, but faith sees a glory in it. This way is best for our safety and most for His honor. And the more simply we can reduce all of our efforts to this one point, looking unto Jesus, the more peace, fervor, and liveliness we shall find in our hearts, and the more success we shall feel in striving against sin and all of its branches." And so we're so prone to exchange the glory of Christ for the lentil stool, stew of self-consumed pride. Pride, it, it hurts. Your, your perceived wrongs and looking bad and someone excelling you and all these different things, they're clouds that are blocking the glory of Christ. And so we just get over self and just, just gaze and look at this beautiful Christ. Another epithemia that we're distracted by is, I'm going to call it anxious unbelief. The American way. Few things cloud over the Christian's joy in Christ than a lack of faith. And it chokes off all power in the Christian life. Faith is is to look beyond ourselves to the remedy. And unbelief just starts this nasty cycle is the more anxiety we feel, the less we see of Christ. We're just getting anxious in our thoughts. We're not looking at Christ, and it's just this building, growing thing. The less we see Christ, the more we feel our anxiety. Anxiety starts uh, a hundred thoughts that cloud Christ from us. They, They go to the scene, and they look at the scene in their own thinking, and all it does is it just starts blocking Christ. And what fills it is anxiety. I'm just fearful, and I'm anxious because I'm looking at everything as if there is no Christ. If Christ is the Son, 
that anxiety is one big dark cloud over the soul. It's an epithemia that just wants to control. And what you're, what you're really anxious about is God's going to get it wrong. He's not going to take care of me. It's just this big epithemia of self. It's a fear that God's going to get it wrong. John Newton said, For this I sigh and long and cry to the Lord to rend the veil of unbelief, scatter the clouds of ignorance, and break down the walls which sin is daily building up to hide him from my eyes. This pride and unbelief is blocking the beauty and the sweetness of Christ from me having epigenosis. So brethren, here it is. Lusts still remain in our hearts to lead us away from Christ. As believers, we still have remaining sin, and, and it still is in there trying to lead us away from this sweet Christ. We have the gift of faith. And in this, this Bible are precious and magnificent promises that are amazing. And they bring us to where we can commune with Christ in relationship. And I want you to let the sweetness of this joy drive out the clouds of wrong desires by a greater desire for Jesus Christ. This is God's program. The only way to overcome sin is with a greater desire. And it comes with this gift of faith. And as I look at Christ, it will drive out all these other lesser desires that are fighting for possession in my heart. Christ is the remedy. The beauty of Christ. Isn't that great? The Christian life is asking you to look at the most beautiful thing in all of the universe and enjoy Him and all that He is for you and go live out those desires for Him. Isn't that beautiful? Why do we fight that? Here, look at the most beautiful thing ever and love it and adore it and run after it. No, I want to go after lesser things. This is the best deal ever. If you'll look with me in verse 5. For this reason then, here's our response to the gospel. Apply all diligence. We looked at this gospel as a resting in Christ and now it produces a diligence to run after conformity to Him. So in your faith, and I'm, this list I'm going to bring over again as I've been thinking about it all week. Look at each one. Moral excellence. How do you get moral excellence? By looking at Christ and seeing His excellence. I want to emulate it. I want to walk in it. And then to your uh, moral excellence, knowledge. Paul said, I've seen him and all I want to do is know him. I want to know this Christ. And in your knowledge, self-control. I don't have to drink up this world. I have everything in Christ I shall not want because the good shepherd. And in your self-control, perseverance, I can't go anywhere else. Where else can I go? I'm going to stay in this day in and day out, pursuing the beauties and the glories of Christ. And in that perseverance, godliness, Christ-centeredness, and then brotherly kindness and love because this Christ has loved me so much, I just want to love others to the point of death like my Christ. So these things are looking at Christ and running to conformity to Him. In verse 8, if these qualities are yours, and this is it, they're increasing. I'm growing in these. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You won't be unfruitful and you won't be useless. God will use a man or woman or child like this mightily. And he who lacks these qualities, as we looked at the communion table last time, is blind or short-sighted. What, what happens? How do I get away from it? You forgot your pur purification of your former sins. You got over the cross. You forgot what happened at Calvary and all of your sins were separated as far as the east is from the west. You, you forget that and Christ will become a cold doctrine. He'll become a distant God to you. Never get over that. Therefore, be all the more what? Diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. And here's that promise of all promises. In this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. And so in the next three weeks, we're going to be working out that last verse uh, in the rest of this chapter. But man, do we have a hope. 
a magnificent promise of abundantly supplied as we enter into the eternal kingdom to be with our God. What a reception we'll have because of the merits of Jesus Christ. We have everything, guys. And I'm going to close then with one last quote. Newton says, I wish we may learn from all of our changes to be sober and watchful, not to rest in grace received, in experience or comforts, but still to be pressing forward and never think ourselves either safe or happy. But when we're beholding the glory of Christ by the light of faith and the glass of the gospel, to view Him as God manifest in the flesh, as all and all in Himself, and all in all for us, is the cheering. This is strengthening. This makes hard things easy and bitter things sweet. This includes all I can wish for my dear friends, that you may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. To know Him is the shortest description of true grace. To know Him better is the surest mark of growth in grace. And to know Him perfectly is eternal life. This is the prize of our high calling. The sum and substance of all that we can desire or hope for is this. To see Him as He is and to be like Him. And to this honor and happiness, He will surely bring all that love His name. To God be the glory. And I pray that we all just would look at this sweet, beautiful Christ and run after Him. And I, I don't ever want to quit because it's so beautiful. And the promises are so magnificent and precious. So let's keep running and journeying. And what I wanted to do is I asked for a little extended time of worship with the, my two favorite songs since we've been in this series. And I messed everything up, but they're going to do it anyways. Praise the Lord. So um, we're going to sing Give Me Jesus and on Christ the solid rock. And I'm going to close now in prayer. And I, I want everyone in this room to have epigenosis. I pray that none of you walk out of here with a Christ who's just in your head and distant and cold and external. The sweet Christ bids you to come all the way to Him. Don't stop. And I'll give you rest for your souls. Let's pray. Father, I pray that everyone in this room would have that epigenosis. I pray they would see the glory and the beauty of Christ and it would throw down every argument in their head, every sin they're wanting to behold over this Christ, every lifting up of their own knowledge over the knowledge of God. I pray right now that they would surrender their lives to the beauty and the glory of this Christ who came and hung on a cross in their place because justice had to be satisfied so they could get mercy. Oh God, what a gospel. And I pray, let them look their eyes out right now and see that. Let them surrender. Let them bow that knee before such a beautiful Christ. God Himself hanging on a cross, bearing the full wrath of His Father so He could give them mercy and a full forgiveness for every sin that they've ever committed and adopt them and bring them near so they could dwell with the living God. Oh Lord, let no soul walk away from that this morning. Let everyone in this room bow and surrender. And now let every heart in this room stand and sing praise to the Lord Jesus Christ because you have given us eyes to see his glory and his loveliness and he is worthy of this worship. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments, or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.